All of that said, of course, uh, the Linen Hall is very happy to uh, have Evelyn here tonight. And we're using this as our opportunity in some ways to uh, celebrate Bloom's Day. Um, there are good reasons for that, uh, because, you know, after all, one of the stories in this collection, Two Gallants Getting Caught, is Evelyn's, and I'm not quite sure what word to use, repost, response, inspired by uh, Joyce's original story. Uh, but actually, it, you know, the Joyce connection goes a bit beyond that. The, the careful readers may well notice a reference in one story to the, the, the very uh, ill-fated uh, Lucia Joyce, Joyce's beloved daughter, and indeed Joyce himself appears uh, in a separate story up at the library. Uh, and as president at the moment of the Linen Hall Library, I'm very glad to see uh, the number of times that libraries do appear in these collections, often in very significant ways uh, and also in very odd shapes. There is a shipboard library, not something I think I've come across reference to before. <laughs> but anyway, that gives you some sense uh, of you know why we're making the Bloomsday connection. It also gives you, I think, a little sense of just the enormous range of uh, these stories and through the interview with Rebecca Peelan and our discussion later on you'll get a, a, a better sense of that uh, but for now I'm just going to hand over for the next couple of minutes to uh, Patsy Horton from Blackstaff Press uh, who will formally I think launch uh, Moving About the Place. Thank you, Eamon. Thanks. And I mean, it's great to see all this chat coming in. It's almost like a mini moving about the place. We're going from California to Italy to France to Clare. So it's just uh, just fantastic to see that. And thank you all for being here and for kicking things off in such a lovely way for Evelyn. Um, I say we're delighted to be here tonight and delighted to be working with the Lynn Hall Library. It's great to work with Scott and with Jason and Eamon and to have this um, great platform to launch the collection and to discuss Evelyn's work. Um, and obviously we have the auspicious uh, Bloomsday connection, which is fantastic as well. It's been a huge pleasure to work with Evelyn and, um, and a privilege really to work with such a fine writer. Um, I've loved working on the collection and um, I think there is a deep understanding in these stories of human nature and of life. There's generosity and humour and sharp intelligence and courage and there's craft and, and talent in abundance. Um, I would regularly stop while I was editing the book over a sentence or a paragraph or at the end of a story and just feel that deep um, satisfaction that you get from something perfectly expressed that really connects with you. Um, there is intellectual and emotional nourishment in this collection. And I think as, again, as talking as, as an editor, there is, um, there is uh, nourishment, writerly nourishment that comes from um, an experienced and intuitive understanding that Evelyn has for words and language. Um, we're very proud of the book at Blackstaff and delighted that Evelyn decided to publish it with us. Um, Blackstaff has a long connection with Evelyn that goes back quite a ways. Um, we published two short story collections with her, Taking Scarlet as a Real Colour and Telling, as well as a novel, A Glass Full of Letters, um, across the 90s and the early noughties. And and um, it's a particular pleasure to be working with her again and to have moving about the place in our list for this year, which is Blackstaff's 50th year um, of publishing. And um, although over the last half century, there has been huge changes in publishing and significant changes for Blackstaff and in, the, in what we publish and in the way that we publish, um, what hasn't changed is the love of great writing and um, and our commitment to providing a platform for that. Um, so reconnecting with Evelyn in this collection just feels very timely and important. Uh, and yeah, I'm very, very pleased about that. Um, we're lucky to have the continuing support of the Arts Council of Northern Ireland to help us publish books like this. And um, in more recent times, the Department for Communities 
And we're especially grateful for that um, in, in the last 18 months that we've had when things have been so tough and tough for arts organisations, including us. Um, I want to finish by congratulating Evelyn on a collection that is deservedly getting a lot of great attention. Um, and to thank all of you for supporting the event. We hope you'll buy and read the book um, and we hope you'll think about buying it from your local bookshop. Um, and if you do enjoy it, tell your friends about it, tweet about it, review it, post about it um, and to share it as much as you can. Um, We've now got a really um, terrific uh, interview with Rebecca Palin and with Evelyn, and we'll move to that now. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Evelyn Conlon, congratulations on your latest collection of short stories, Moving About the Place, which is published by Blackstaff Press. Yeah. So it's a, a selection of 11 stories, or 10 stories and a novella, yeah. is that correct? That's right, yeah. So I'm interested in the title. The title is all about movement, but many of the stories are very explicitly about movement and moving to different places. Monaco, Italy, Australia, South Africa, Japan. But there's some Irish stories, or I think most of them are set in Ireland, that you might look immediately as being static. But actually, I think there's movement mm. throughout the whole collection. Would you like to make a comment on that? Um, thanks, Rebecca. Um, I think really I had a number of stories written over a number of years. And this is the thing that happens as well when you're working in with a novel and short stories. Quite often you're working sometimes on a story and not really thinking about it fitting in somewhere. And it was interesting because it's the editor in Blackstaff, Patsy Horton, who actually chose mm. those particular stories and left another few out. So the, the, the process of the moving or, or the theme of the moving became clearer as the collection was got together. But interestingly enough, it, is call, it was called Moving About the Place before, <laughs> before you know, us wanting to move about the place yeah. now. So it was called Moving About the Place as in the place being the world. Yeah. And I had wanted to have a look at that whole notion of different different stories being set in different places. But a lot of the people within the stories are Irish. Mm. And for instance, the first one is about the person who doesn't move yeah. and who um, sort of resents the notion of the ones who did move. Mm. And then it ends with a person who did move and intended coming back to Ireland, but couldn't. Uh, am I ruining the story? No, I'm not. No. Yeah, so. That's great. At borders. I'm interested in borders uh, because there are quite a few of the stories. There's one explicitly about mm. the border in Ireland, yeah. our reaction to the border mm. in Ireland, I suppose it is. But borders generally seem to appear, crossing borders, moving around borders or being aware of borders, different kinds of borders. Mm. Uh, do you think borders are important to the human psyche? And would it have anything to do with the fact that you're from Monaghan? Yeah. Okay, it's funny now about that story, which is called Disturbing Words. Yeah. Um, uh, when Sinead Gleeson was putting together the anthology of short stories by women from the North, I said I had wanted to write a story about the border, the Irish border, and about living on a border. And I'd wanted to do it for a while, and I'd thought, okay, I'll actually set about doing it. And I have to say, I had no idea how difficult it would be. And I think that's partly because um, the, the sensitivities that I grew up with around the border uh, uh, all came back to me. And it was very difficult to figure out how to set the story. So, you know, a lot of work had to go into what, what is the tone I want in this story. So I certainly think living beside a border, hmm. I, I, of course, has a huge effect on you. But also the other thing is, is remember, we like my parents had both been born before there was a border. Uh, so when you're living on a border, it actually means a lot more than if you're sort of living in Dublin and talking about the border, you know, uh, leaving aside 
the 30 years of the Troubles, leaving that aside, it still doesn't mean as much as it does when you're actually living out. So I began to think about borders and the way they go. And if you think about borders as well in, uh, you know, in Europe, the way borders have shifted, like I mentioned Alsace-Lorraine going in and out, one minute it's in Germany, one minute it's in France. Um, the other thing is, is I began to think about how our border here was actually drawn up. And then I began to look at when were the first discussions had about it? Who decided it would be six counties and not four? Um, all those kind of things, all those kind of questions. And then I began to think in Korea, you know, we sort of think like in my head, I think, oh, there's two countries, North Korea and South Korea, but there isn't. There was Korea. And somebody drew a line and a map and made North Korea and South Korea. So, so that all becomes part of the story. And then, which I'm not going to ruin, uh, that's why the protagonist has a certain attitude that they have and do what they do in the end around the border. So was, was there a bit of a lesson there, Evelyn, in the difficulty of writing something that's a bit too close to home, as opposed to this moving about and moving into foreign parts? Not alone yeah. was it about Ireland, but it was actually about something that you'd grown up with almost yeah. very close to. Yeah, I do think that. I do think that. And I also think, you see, there's a whole folklore around yeah. border. And, and also there's a sensitivity. And um, I can remember, for instance, I mean, I make a reference to this, people who would write about the border who don't know what they're talking about, who are deeply insulting the people who have actually learned mm. to deal with the notion of border. So yes, all those things had to come into it. So yeah, so it was a different kind of a story than other ones. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Now the dedication for this collection is, it says, for those who kept their heads open, mm. friends here, there and everywhere. Yeah. And the first thing that struck me about that when I read it was keep their heads open as opposed to keep their heads up. Yeah. I don't know whether you want to comment on that, but I just wondered then, thinking about the, the dedication, yeah. thinking about the content of the collection and, and the overall kind of themes uh, which are very mm. diverse within the collection, COVID came to mind then mm. uh, about this notion about moving and movement mm. outwards. Mm. And mm. even when the, in the stories were people mm. like the woman who didn't go anywhere, yeah. There is there is implied movement, yeah. even if it's only within her head or she's playful about mm. it. Did it have anything to do with COVID? No, it didn't, you see. None of it does. But then sometimes accidents like this happen and a story begins to mean something. You know, stories, everything that a writer writes means something different by the time the readers get their hands yeah. on it. And, and, and as I was editing this collection all of which had been written beforehand, except for the last one that's set in Monaco. That hadn't been written before, uh, before I started to edit it. Uh, uh, that was finished since the COVID situation had arrived with us. But all the others had in fact been finished. The title, the dedication, my first collection of short stories was called My Head is Opening. As life goes on and as I got older I began to realise that that title meant a way more even than I meant it to mean and that's why at this stage now during the fourth collection I I wanted to dedicate the book to friends that I have known of course in Ireland but also in those different places that are in the book mm. and therefore and then I began to and also you know you realise as you get older which are, you know that the people who remain friends with you are the people who have managed to keep an open view of the world. Mm -hmm. And there'll be some of that missing next year. We'll have to work on keeping that one going. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's been an extraordinary 18 yeah. months, but I think, I think the collection is wonderfully placed now in a, in a way to reflect some of that. But not, not alone what people might be missing, but what they can also look forward to. Yeah. It's, it's, so it's an extraordinarily diverse mm. collection, I think, Evelyn. That's yeah. the way I would describe it. Uh, it, it's, it can be quite uh, mischievous and playful, I think. And it can be quite, uh, not, not sinister or dark, but sombre, I think, in mm. some of the stories. And also uh, in your own inimitable way, lots of politics and history mm. included. Mm. Um, but there is one story that stands out for me, and that's two glants getting caught... Uh, 
And that appeared, I think, that same story in Dubliners 100, is that right? Yeah. Which celebrated the anniversary of, uh, the 100th anniversary mm. of Dubliners, mm. James Joyce's Dubliners. And The Guardian, uh, the reviewer in The Guardian, mm. loved the story, mm. I understand, mm. and said that if, if they were taking bets on which story Joyce would have liked the most, it would be Evelyn Conlon's Two Galants mm. Getting Caught. Is that your first play around mm. with James Joyce in the nicest possible way, yeah. of course? Oh, absolutely. It's my first. And I would never have thought of doing it mm. except that I was asked. Mm. And I have to say I hesitated slightly. In fact, I, I suppose being honest, I was travelling <coughs> with um, the last novel, Not the Same Sky, when I was asked. And I think if I had been at home in my own place and had a bit more time to think about it, I might have I might have said no. Mm. But then having said yes, I thought, gosh, this is rather interesting. And of course, it's a wonderful story. Mm. I mean, Joyce's story is a wonderful mm. story. So what I wanted to do with that was, you know, not reply to him as such, but to try and take the spirit of what he was doing with the two characters, mm. with the two bios. I think they're two boils. Yeah. In my head, I see Joyce as seeing them as two boils. Mm. So that was my way into it. And it was certainly the first time I've ever done anything. And and I have to say, the last. Really? Why? Yeah, because, do you know the way I think that if you were working in theatre, mm. I can understand how you might more readily take on mm. that sort of a notion but i think to put it down on paper uh because he was so extraordinary in the way he could write the short story i don't think i would be taking it on again just too fast sh too big shoes to fill yeah. maybe well i enjoyed i enjoyed at some level the notion i was also very careful that i didn't I didn't want to destroy anything within mm. his story. I don't think you did. Yeah, I think good, it's a brilliant good, story. Good. I really enjoyed it. I hadn't seen it before. I didn't see it when yeah, it was in the... Yeah. I didn't read it when it was in the Dubliners 100. But the, that distinctive voice that you have, even though these mm. stories are very diverse, uh, are, you know, you can, you can see the Evelyn Conlon uh, voice. I can hear the voice yeah. throughout, which I love. Um, but that one is slightly different. Yeah. And, but I found no discomfort or yeah. awkwardness in it. I just thought it was very, very oh, clever. Well, and it yeah. is about um, plagiarism, mm. but people taking mm. a woman's work, mm. two boyos, yeah. taking a woman's work yeah. and plagiarising yeah. it. And, and you see, in the original story, what it is is that the two fellows are plagiarising. They're plagiarising the woman's work. I mean, I kept thinking about... Well, if they're taking money from her, they're played, they're, they're, you know, they're, yeah. and I thought about this thing about, um, sometimes, you know, when we talk about women writers and mm. perhaps not getting the space, not so much, you know, that's, a, that's another big, long discussion around that, which we won't go into, but sometimes, and it would apply to some men as well, you know, you're taking away the person's livelihood when you're not mm. giving them the credit that mm. they had done with their work. Mm. And that's really what what Joyce is saying. Mm. So I then was shifting it yeah. to the notion. So these people are at a Joyce conference mm. and then somebody is doing mm. to a woman's work. Mm. Whatever. So, mm. so, you know, it's about thinking about what his story actually meant mm. and then me taking that into what I wanted to make of mm. that. I think it's a great story. Oh, a very different story is Virgin Birth. Mm which is, mm. uh, um, an I think, an extraordinary mm. concept and story. And it's, it's about the first woman to deliberately become pregnant mm. after Hiroshima. Mm. Do you want to talk yeah. about that a little bit? Um, uh, I went to Japan and I really did feel that it was my first time to go to Japan. And of course, it's very far away from here. It, it might be my last. I didn't know. And I thought I really have to go to Hiroshima. And my journey to there on the train was just extraordinary. And I find the whole experience of it quite astonishing. Then what happened to me was I wrote a non-fiction piece, an article for the Irish Times. But somehow or another, it didn't feel complete or it didn't feel that I had said properly what I felt about the place. 
And when I was there, I spent a few days there, and I mean, it was extraordinary to try to find a hotel, and mm. and of course I have no Japanese, and I mean, I was back as a child because the language is so extraordinarily different if you don't know it. You know, you have to point at things and mm. all the rest of it. Um, so my feeling all the time was, was how did these people get hope to actually rebuild a city mm. when you think of what happened then? And, and how fast it happened, like it takes a minute, it took a second or whatever number of seconds it took to destroy all this city and to destroy whatever number of people were killed, 120,000 maybe in a few minutes, and who knows how many afterwards. So when I thought about it more, I thought how brave it was to actually rebuild and how every single step to be taken mm. had to be so full of bravery. And then I thought, gosh, the first person to decide to become pregnant. I'm not necessarily saying getting pregnant because one could get pregnant accidentally. But to actually make, make the, decision the decision to get pregnant, yeah. it is the most extraordinary um, belief mm. in the world and hope and hope yeah. extraordinary yeah. and and how could anybody do it so I had a bit of I had a, had a bit of research to do mm. to try and figure out was contraception available at the time would somebody actually have been making mm. a decision to do it? so okay so I did all that and then I mm. returned in my mind to what I had felt mm. when I was in Hiroshima and worked with this character mm. uh, who, who who has the who has who decides to become pregnant. It's, it's an extraordinary mm. story, I think. Um, now, I think you're going to do a bit of a reading for us, Evelyn, from one of my other favourites from the collection. I may get the title wrong because I don't have it written down, but it's yeah. the things... The reasons that I the know reasons. of. Yep. Yeah. All right, I'll read a little bit of this, a little bit of this. Because um, in a way, it sort of deals with some of the issues about writing. And and also, because a few of the stories are, are talking are about... You know, us making, having preconceived notions about what people are. And this is actually essentially people having a preconceived notion mm. of what grandmothers are. But in fact, this grandmother is not like that. And indeed, many aren't. And you know, when I, when I, when I think of this, I think of Leland Bardwell, mm. the writer mm. Leland Bardwell. So the reasons that I know of that we are not allowed to talk to our grandmother. It began with me having to do an essay for school about my grandmother. Only some of us were asked to do it. It was for a competition for a visiting writer who was coming to our class the following month. Is that all he does, sir? Right, a boy asked. Yes, that's what he is, a writer, just like your father is an actuary, I believe. That may have been the first time the boy had a name for what his father was. Those of us who were chosen made a show of huffing and puffing and told the others that they were lucky, but secretly I was pleased. The essay was to be about how the old spent their Saturday nights. Mr. Moraine was particularly interested in how those who lived alone fared on such a busy evening. He must have chosen those of us who had grannies on their own. Maybe it was not because we were good at essays. We could concentrate on aspects of loneliness. Were they more poignant in contrast to the fullness of the clamour and the clatter of a Saturday night? Poignant, P-O-I-G-N-A-N-T. We could look it up in the dictionary. And while we were at it, we could find out the difference between bathos and pathos. The ones who weren't chosen laughed at that, and some of them pointed their fingers at us. Mr. McGrain saw it and said everyone had to look up the words. And I would stick to the truth as near as possible, he said. It was this commandment that made me make my father come to see my grandmother at nine o'clock on Saturday night. When we arrived at the door, she wasn't in and my father seemed annoyed by this. We puttered about for a while, but she didn't come back. Are you sure Mr. McGrain meant you to be so precise? That seems more like a report to me than an essay. Surely an essay should be more imaginative. I hated it when my father got all know-all like that, as if he knew better than my teacher. I said, bolstered by the order to accuracy, yes. Oh, well then, he said, we'd better look for her. 
We went next door to my grandmother's neighbour, an old woman who scared me the way that I think grandmothers are maybe meant to, but which mine didn't. My father asked her if she might know where my grandmother was. What time is it, she said, that blooming clock is never right. This struck me as odd. Surely there would be more than one clock in the house. Ours had at least four that I could think of. Maybe I would put that in my essay, that my grandmother's neighbour had only one clock and it was always wrong. It's a, let me see, and my father pulled back the sleeve of his jacket to look at his watch, which had a purple face. I could hear a baby crying at the house on the other side. Half past nine now, he said. Half past nine on a Saturday night. Well, she should have her feet well up in Slattery's back there in Slattery's now. You know, Slattery's, the pub. My father closed his face. You have to know him well to see him doing that. I know him well. Slattery's, the pub, she said again, putting the emphasis on the last word. Yes, yes, my father said touchily, and my grandmother's neighbour chuckled. What did she mean back in Slattery's, I asked when we were in the car. Oh, she's from the West. They say back with everything. My father sounded cross. I was only trying to get him to open up his face again. I was sent to bed the minute we got home unreasonably early, I thought. Later, as the noise from the kitchen got louder, I left my room and I sat on the top of the stairs. There is always a child on the top of the stairs. Otherwise, how would we learn? You want to see the crowd she was with. Did you know any of them, my mother asked. Not one. Tell me again what she said, my mother interrupted, sounding as if she wanted to put the answer out flat on the table and examine it the way she did before she sewed something. <clears throat> she said that I should be grateful she had a life and wasn't sitting at home alone moping about. She said that I had no business checking up on her, that she'd had enough constriction when she was rearing me. Are you sure it was constriction, she said. Yes, I'm sure, my father ground out. I would hardly make it up. And did she really ask you to leave, my mother asked, in her kind of voice. Well, as good as. The conversation went on like this for a long time, sounding like turned down music or distant wind. But I couldn't follow it, really. And also, I did get bored because I couldn't understand what they were getting so exercised about. You can use that word as a description. It does not mean that they have been running or swimming all night. On Monday, Mr. McGrain asked me how the essay was going and I said, fine. Okay, brilliant, Evelyn. I love that story. And isn't it funny when you were talking <coughs> about the previous story, the virgin birth, and you being in Hiroshima, yeah. feeling like ch a child again with, that, with the language, yeah. the way that pl the boy takes a word like exercise yeah. You can use that word in that way, yeah. but he doesn't understand. I loved yeah. it. I absolutely yeah. loved it. Great. Now, Evelyn, when you sent me the final, the final story in the collection uh, is called How Things Are with Hannah. Yeah. And when you sent me, it's a novella. Yeah. Uh, and when you sent me the information on it, you said, and this is a quote from you, that it was based on a character from mm. your last novel, not, not the same sky, quote, who had to have her own space. Yeah. Can you explain to me what you mean by that? Um, when I was writing the last novel, I had a person in the 1970s in it who was between the modern woman and those women, those girls of the 1840s and 1850s. But she didn't stay in the novel. And perhaps she should have stayed in, maybe, or who knows, but it became possibly too crowded and maybe it was enough with the modern voice and then than the other voice. But somehow or another, that person stayed with me and I felt that she had to have a voice somewhere. So I thought perhaps it would be a short story. I didn't, in fact, think it would be a novella. But in the end, that's what it became, because I think she had more to say. And in a way, it's about... And I. I didn't, of course, see the collection. I didn't see this as part of the collection. That's what I'm saying. You know, the editor comes in and then things change. So, so I wasn't framing it like this. But then I realised that this is really central to that notion of moving. Because in this story, the person is moving away 
from their original home with the intentions of going back, mm. which may or may not happen. Mm. Now, just to, to finish up with this last question, which is related to that, you've, you've had an, a, a really impressive dedication to one of my favourite genres, which is the short story. Yeah. Throughout your career, you've no, mm. this is now your fourth collection and you've four novels. Mm. Do, do you, do, you know, the, does that material decide whether it's going to be a short story, a novella yeah. or a novel? I think it probably does. I certainly know that when I started to write Skin of Dreams, which is a novel, I wanted it to be a short story, but it wasn't. And quite often what would happen to me is, is something comes into my mind and I think, and I, and I mean, I have to admit this, I think with great delight, ah, this one will be a short story. Okay. So I think they are completely different genres. They, well, we know that. Yeah. But it's a completely different part of your brain as well that you must use as a writer when you're writing a short story. I definitely think, uh, I have never had a situation in which I was in the middle of a short story and thought it was part of a novel. Whereas I have started with a short story and thought it might have to expand out. But uh, happily, I, 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 I think this is a story and off it goes. Well, I, I just think you do the short stories brilliantly, which is not a reflection on your novels at all, because I think they're excellent as well. But I just love, I love short stories. Lovely. Evelyn, we're finished, I think. So yeah. uh, thank you very much and the very best of luck with the, with the collection. I think it's going to be a great success. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. You're very much. I hope that played uh, reasonably well for everybody because it is, I think, a really, a really good interview. And um, can I can I just say that I mean the reading? We'll have another a little bit of reading from Evelyn in, in a moment or two, uh, but the reading was particularly, I thought, uh, good and interesting. And I just love that sentence that there's always a child on the top of the stairs. Otherwise, how would we learn anything? <laughs> um, and it's absolutely typical of the of the way in which these stories move to very specific and not always expected points of view i think um and i'm keeping i'll keep an eye on the on the chat now which is full of just simple praise and congratulations um and people's enjoyment of, of things uh but I, I would ask anyone who wants to ask a question to put it into the chat function and i'll i'll try to keep an eye on it uh but i'll i'll get the ball rolling um uh, and um Evelyn, I see that you are currently muted. Could you unmute yourself? <laughs> I, I unmuted. Good woman, yourself. I just the, the question I wanted to start, and given that you know, given the places in the, in the title of the collection, um, how many of these stories actually started with place rather than you know a topic you wanted to talk about or you were talking about the novella having a character you wanted to come back to but so many of the stories seem to me you know absolutely fixed in their place and and some of them could only happen you know i'm, I'm thinking of, of, of whether it's disturbing words or or you know up at the library they could only happen in that specific place mm -hmm. so how important was place then as a starting point uh no, maybe I just became very interested in holding a story with places that I had been. And I mean, sometimes you might think that's a very odd thing to do. If you're in Monaco, why aren't you thinking about the sunshine and the boats and other things? Mm. And yet all I could keep thinking about, but actually that's an interesting story because that, was, that, that story is where, where changed three times and, and to the point now where... I'm not sure what that story is about at all. But the original person in it, who was actually a man who I think doesn't quite know where he is. And that comes into one view that I saw one day as well. So no, the story comes from some kind of feeling that I would have, but it's associated with that place. Okay, if we go back to one of the ones called The Lie of the Land, 
that, okay, so it'll be too difficult to explain and maybe I should never explain the ins and outs of that. But one day when I was in a place, actually doing a reading, a charity reading for a library, there you go, Eamon, in a school uh, in Ache after the tsunami. And uh, something came into my head about that. And I thought, that I want to write this story. That this is where it will be, because of because of the people I met and the kind of way in which people live who are moving about from one place to the other all the time, and they're moving with jobs and they're totally dependent. You know, I say at one point that the women are totally dependent upon each other and the lies they tell as well and whatever, like that it's that absolute dependence when you're very far away. So I would say that each one was placed. Um, I see we've started to get some questions in from uh, the audience and, and there's one which is actually really close to a question I wanted to ask myself, which is from uh, Andrew Wiley saying, I love the story about Mark Gibson, dear you, um, and can, can you talk about Yeah, I know. Talk about really this annoying story? annoying to me. Again. Again. Oh yeah, Violet Gibson. All right. Yeah. So I came across the story of Violet Gibson. I think I've said this before through a review that Dermot Bolger did, and that was the first time I really knew about the story. And the thing about that, Violet Gibson is the, is the Irish woman who tried to assassinate Mussolini. Mm. And if she had succeeded, who knows? Because we certainly know that Mussolini had, 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 had ideas of, uh, uh, you know, fascism before Hitler did. But I suppose, you know, if you think of, of, of strong, dangerous people, um, they're all maybe thinking the same thing at the same time, but that's, 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 that's down another road. But um, she was then incarcerated by her family. Essentially, Mussolini couldn't bear the idea. He didn't want to put her on trial because he felt that if she went on trial, he would have to face up to the fact that this woman had almost got him. Not only was he almost assassinated, but it was a woman and she'd almost got him. And that wouldn't have fitted in with the machismo of the day. So between her family and them, there was an arrangement made that she would be incarcerated essentially in the uh, asylum in Northampton. So um, I had a way, I, I was going to write the story in several different ways and then it's too long to explain to you now how I finally arrived on the notion, haha, <laughs> one morning, the mornings are very good, uh, that the way to do it was through, letter, through a letter, which is then addressed to you, the reader, who has got the letter in the bottle. And the reason that I do it like that is, is because of that, that terrible tragedy of all the really intelligent, wonderful letters that she had written pleading to end her days in a convent. And um, that's it, really, that's the story. And then off I go. And I stayed as close as I could to the actual facts of her life. There are no facts in there that are not true. Uh, but obviously there is an interpretation and that's the interpretation that I bring to, to, to her view. You know, that, that's it. One of, the, I mean, one of the sentences in, in, in that story, I may be paraphrasing it slightly, uh, which, which really seems to, to leap out at me was that, uh, that Violet, you had Violet at one point say, I'm leaving a lot to your imagination, which is an intimate thing to do to a stranger but I hope you can understand. And part of the reason it leapt out at me was that, that it, it struck me as in certain sorts of ways, the definition of the short story, mm. to, to leave the reader um, free in their imagination and actually how intimate the short story is. I, I wonder if you wanted to, to say something about, about that. I, I, think, I think you're very right. I think you're very right because I think that a novel you know, it, you, it, it, I mean, there's loads of space for the thing to move in and out. And I mean, I've said this before, certainly to students, that you are allowed to bore yourself for a few seconds, uh, the writer is in a novel, and to bore the reader for a few seconds. Not an awful long time, but a little bit. In a short story, that, that's not the case. And what you have actually done in a short story is, is you've entered into a contract with your reader to try and get it all said, as fast as possible, you know, as fast as possible. And yet, 
in a way maybe to leave the just to leave the reader with something that they themselves can put back into it. Um, in some ways, I don't think that you do that when you're writing a novel. I think I think you're more didactic. And actually, maybe you're more dictatorial as well when you're writing a novel. I think in a short story, it's more of a dance. And I think for me, everybody, every all writers work differently. But for me, I need to be very ready with the short story. I think a little bit like Tilly Olsen and the notion of while I stand here ironing, uh, or a little bit like uh, I would have a lot of work. I would rework and rework and rework a short story in my head a way more than I would a novel. Mm. So. Mm. No, um, because, uh, you know, partly I, I, I think one of the, the, the features of, of these stories is, is how, I mean, you know, given that the story is often very, you know, an enclosed and compact mm. genre, um, the way the resonances uh, continue out from them. So that that character you were talking about in up at, up at the library, Monsieur Black, mm. who we never quite know very mm. much about. No, no more do we know, um, you know, what happens to Hannah in the novella. Yeah. Um, and, you know, no more, no more do we find out, for instance, in Virgin Birth, you know, a woman undertaking this extraordinary journey but yeah. then not doing the very thing she yeah. went to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in all of those cases, you, you, you're you leaving those resonances, that the, op yeah. the open-endedness of that, I think, available yeah. to readers. Oh. Yes, I think so. And I think that's an absolutely okay thing to do. I think it's, it's, I think I rather enjoy doing it. I think maybe when I'm coming to the end of a short story, I do sort of feel that I have, that I am in, communication with a reader the reader is one reader who knows who that reader is but I mean to me that's who I am in communication with is one reader mm -hmm. and 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 you know there's a kind of a playful thing a bit as well and a trust in the reader uh, not to actually tell them exactly how it's going to end Leave well, a bit to their imagination as well yeah, there's there's a, a wonderful comment just on that here. Uh, how your stories wonderfully require the reader's collaboration and complicity. I'm very conscious of, of time, and, and I know you've agreed to do a little reading for us from yeah. Two Galants yeah. Getting Caught, uh, a, a story that has been mentioned a number of times, but uh, again, one of my favourites. Um, and, and rather than us get cut, cut off <laughs> unexpectedly, yeah. uh, I'd like to hear from Evelyn. Um, before, uh, before right, finish. okay. So. Well, obviously, thank you, Evelyn. Okay, well, this is obviously two, two, two gallants or two gallants getting caught, and it, this is, the, this is the, 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 the play with Joyce. It was a fairly beautiful morning, not stunning or anything like that, but passable for September in Dublin. The usual finger-wagging mist was hanging about, but there was an occasional chink in the grey, a small curtain being parted coquettishly to show what was up above. The sky was threatening to come out. If you had never seen continuous cerulean, you would have thought that the whole day was all right. Two boys, one called Lenehan and the other Corley, turned in their beds. One of them vaguely wondered about last night and what had happened to give him this twinge of uneasiness with himself. But the turning over tumbled him happily from self-examination back into sleep. The participants at the conference, reluctantly called another look at Joyce, collected their various bits and pieces, assembled themselves as best as they could and trooped out onto the streets of Dublin to make their way to Trinity College. Some people knew every name of every street, others had to plan that route. They were off to make sense of things through looking at writers and what they might have meant and how the dead ones stood up or didn't. This was as good a way of making sense of the world as, say, business is or prayer. 
I leave it at that. I'm happy for the time. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Uh, I mean, speaking as you know, as, as an academic, I mean, one of the story, the things I like in that story is you have somebody read the the Patrick Kavanagh poem "Who Killed James Joyce," and then just leave because to say anything further would be <laughs> to, to be uh, hypocritical. Uh, as, and it's a wonderful moment in um, what is, I think, just a and really genuinely. A, the word congratulations keeps popping up in the in the chat here, Evelyn, and uh, I think all I could do is just add my own uh, congratulations to you for what is a wonderful collection. Um, it, it has given me a lot of a lot of pleasure over the last few days, certainly, and um, I, and I know it's been you know very well received as well in the Irish Times Book of the Day and Nisha Dolan's uh, review of it. I think very um, good. Um, can I say, can I just sort of say thank you? I mean, this is all very odd, as we know, but how we're doing things instead of being in a bookshop and whatever, but, you know, it, it's good. Can I really thank Blackstaff? It was just, a, it was a total treat. And can I thank you this evening and Lennon Hall and the readers and the people who put up with me while I was writing this and all the rest of it. But really, <laughs> it was a great pleasure to be doing it with Blackstaff. It was a really great pleasure because thank I knew it's their 50th year as well. So I'm really pleased about that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Evelyn. Wonderful. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. So thanks to everyone. Everybody, uh, thanks to Scott for the technical side of things. Thanks to Patty for her contributions. And most of all, thanks and many congratulations again to Evelyn Conlon. Uh, it has been, it's been a joy, uh, even in this, in this odd set of circumstances. And again, from comments, I'm, I'm assuming that other people enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, those of you who haven't read the book yet, leave now and start reading immediately. You will not regret it. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Bravo, bravo. <laughs>